to the 1000 plus subscribers of that other gamer. Thank you all so much. And now to celebrate our milestone, I present to you episode 1 of a new show for our channel. Here we go. On this first episode of Examining Video Game Artworks, we'll take a look at an image found in Dishonored, specifically a painting of the Pendleton siblings titled Custis, Morgan, and the Postulate Child, and why it can be considered as a successful piece of creative ingenuity. But before we begin, I would like you to know that ever since day one of working on this project, it has been a priority of mine to identify and credit the real-world artist of this specific piece. And unfortunately, in that pursuit, I encountered a snag. If we do a search on this matter, there's one name that comes up only once among multiple suggested links. Cedric Peyravernay, found on the Dishonored Wiki website. He's a high-profile illustrator who worked with a multitude of studios, including Arcane. Indeed, he's credited as one of the artists in the Dunwall Archives, Dishonored One's official art book. But here's the problem. Unlike the book that succeeded it, where the artists are properly tagged per item, the Archives has no such naming conventions, and the painting in question is unsigned. Upon checking Cedric's art station and Instagram galleries, some of the other paintings that are part of the Anton Sokolov collection, like the Hiram Burroughs and the Lady Boyle, are proudly on display, but not the Pendletons. At first I thought maybe there were two people who worked on the Sokolov paintings, considering that there seems to be two slightly different styles going on. The first can only be described as being grainy where the dry brushstrokes of the background meld with the subject at various locations, like here on the outsider. The other style is more clear-cut towards the subject, but is replaced by more pronounced brushstrokes, as seen here on the creases of Vera Moray's dress. It's also worth noting that this one is signed, unlike the former, but both are confirmed to be part of Mr. Peyravenay's works. I also checked out the other artists' respective online portfolios, but it seems Cedric is the only one who worked on the paintings parallel to what we're looking for. So he's most likely the one who created it. There's just no way to be certain unless somebody asks him directly, which is exactly what I did. I sent him a private message and at the time of this video's publication, I haven't received a response yet. I'll make sure to pin the update in the comment section once we have it. But for now, let's move on to what the painting is most likely about. If you've played Dishonored before, then you're most likely aware that there's really not much to the story behind the Pendleton painting. All we know is that it's part of the in-game collectible artworks done by Sokolov, as mentioned before. At one point, it lands in the hands of an art dealer named Bunting through nefarious means, and that's all there is to it. Any information on how and why the painting got commissioned are non-existent. We can, however, make an informed guess as to its nature through contextual clues, spread throughout the first two missions after Corvo arrived at the Houndpits pub. You see, the Pendleton brothers are primarily split into two unequal divides, the dominant older twins on one side, and the youngest Trevor, who's clearly subservient by comparison. In the game, we have multiple accounts of just how bad the twins treated Trevor at a young age. Chapter 32 As yet I have said little of my brothers Morgan and Custis. Twins they are, four years senior to me. Morgan is the larger of the two brutes by a slight bit. From earliest memory, they abused me in every way. I'm not the first to claim their elder siblings were cruel, but my suffering was unique, I promise you. 
At the tender age of five, they tied me to the crib and set inside it assorted vipers they had collected over several weeks. My howls and my breathing were muffled by a blanket, and so it was hours before the nurse found me barely alive. I had kicked a few serpents to a pulp and others had slithered away, but not before I'd been bitten a dozen times or more on my legs, arms, and face. The wounds kept me convalescing for months while those two got away with barely a tongue lashing. Wallace! Bring me wine. <clears throat> Tomorrow I will regale you with the special gift they gave me on my 10th birthday party. This practice continued up until they got older, as Trevor himself told Corvo in one instance. Six months ago I was out at the estate hunting with my brothers. Custis and Morgan were always better shots, Though one of them nearly killed me, all for a cruel joke. Strange. When it comes to their civic roles as aristocrats, the twins for whatever reason are the only ones who have power to influence policies through parliamentary votes, even though Trevor himself is also a nobleman of equal standing. If he wanted to sway any public decision, he's left with no other choice but to ask the twins for it. A futile gesture, as evidenced by this letter addressed to a cousin Anna of his, titled Pendleton's Family Crisis. Morgan and Custis continue to resist my efforts and are no longer responding to my letters. My brothers have always been arrogant, utterly convinced of their own certainty, and they don't really give two figs for anyone else in the world. I implore you, if you know where they are, to speak with them. With these facts established, we can now form a hypothesis as to how the painting came to be. The most likely possibility is that the group portrait was a request by the twins, a couple of nobles who Sokolov may be found interesting, and therefore agreed for a price, similar to how the Vera Moray was commissioned. It's also highly probable that Custis and Morgan gave specific instructions to diminish Trevor's presence, as another one of their hijinks. This is backed up by the fact that Sokolov, known for being able to mingle with nobility, is most likely aware of just how powerful the twins are in comparison to the youngest sibling. So that's what the painting is all about, an illustration of the lopsided power dynamics among the Pendleton siblings, at which the real-world artist through Sokolov was able to masterfully portray. The title of the piece which omits Trevor's name is a dead giveaway but nonetheless we can immediately see the intended message at first glance, and that's why I consider it a success. But in order to understand how this was exactly achieved, it's now time for our analysis. Upon looking at the piece, our attention is immediately drawn towards the eyes, a primal reaction that we all share. Specifically, those pair found at the center, considered to be the strongest position in any rectangular frame like this. To be certain that we look in those areas first, the dark eyes are surrounded by very bright highlights on their foreheads, noses, and mouths. What we end up having are areas of great contrast that makes things very clear and will draw attention regardless of how busy the background may be similar to what happens when we add a black border to white text, for example. These focal points are also supported by their light dress shirts that helps to draw attention towards their heads. Notice how they're purposefully not as bright as the highlights on the faces, as to not supersede their importance. As we establish the existence of the central character, we shift our attention to the individual on the right, a gut reaction to the fact that he looks exactly like the former, and is also closer to him. Only after those two are registered in our minds that we look at the third subject on the left, and immediately tell that there is a clear separation going on. One is due to the twins' apparent biological nature, and the other is because of the left and right characters differing proximity from the front and center, where the other twin stands almost at the same plane, thanks to his slight left tilt, while Trevor is clearly positioned one step back. This hierarchy of importance is supported by a number of visual cues, such as their head height that follows the sequence of our gaze. The central figure is the tallest, 
followed by the other twin, and then Trevor. It's also reflected on the number of lines present on their clothes. If we count them off, the central figure has six clearly visible outlines. The one on the right has five, and Trevor has four. If we look at their hands, we can see that there's a pattern going on as well. The center character's digits are entirely visible, while most of the fingers on the other twin are mostly hidden, and Trevor's hands are not visible at all. Looking at them one after another, it's almost like an animation sequence of a bent arm being placed to a resting position on the side. Now, you're probably aware of this golden rule in composition, that we should not crop an image exactly at the joints because it looks odd. Our eyes tend to perceive them like they've been chopped off. But in this particular piece, we can safely assume that it was done on purpose, as a symbolic representation of Trevor's lack of power, that I outlined in chapter 2 of this video. This, however, begs a question about the twins. If the character on the right is secondary to the central figure, does this mean one is slightly more powerful than the other? Not really. If we crop the image to accommodate only Custis and Morgan, we can see that it looks just fine, and the reason for that will be explained later. For now, the important thing to remember in this arrangement is that we're dealing with two identical people, and when they're in close proximity like this, we no longer see them as separate individuals, but rather as one cohesive unit. This is very similar to the way we look at a six-sided die, for example. When set to two, we don't count off each of the dots separately. We identify both in an instant. The same thing is happening here. Our initial assessment will see one, two, and three people. But after realizing the clear-cut separation, we only see two groups the youngest Trevor taking up one-third of the space, and the dominant twins occupying the remaining two-thirds. We also have other visual cues that enforces this segregation, such as this patch of light yellow paint in the background, walling off Trevor from the rest. There's also this dark line that connects the twins' heads, enforcing their strong connection. If we look at their coats, we can tell that Custis and Morgan's have a slightly bright and warm tone to them, as opposed to Trevor's dark and bluish palette. We can also tell that the twins are being lit by a red side light, unlike the orange one seen on the youngest. Going into the details, there are gilded accents on the collars of the twins, a feature missing on the other character. To top this off, the central figure also has a bias towards his left side, visible in the way his head is slightly rotated, and on his hands that favor the same direction, separating them from Trevor even more. In any other context, this kind of grouping would pose as a challenge to any artist because it will be perceived as being off-kilter. But seeing the painting entirely, it looks just fine. If we imagine the portrait to be pinned at a wall on its center, it doesn't feel like it would lean to one side, and this was achieved in two ways. First is through the very strongly positioned center character, that pins the balance of the entire painting in place. The influence is so strong that it doesn't matter if the head and hands are slightly favoring one side, when his entire upper body is symmetrically facing towards the front. In fact, this kind of slight deviation from the front are beneficial, as to not make the character's pose look stiff. An easy example I can give you are the numerous depictions of Christ on the cross, where the symmetrical pose is offset by a slight turn of the head and knees. To emphasize the stability that this central character brings, the real-world artist also decided to make him do a hand cradle, a very powerful gesture in this context. If we equate this painting to a piece of furniture, like a high table, the central character is like the rod that holds it in place, and at the bottom is a metal base that's also bolted to the floor. This is why we're able to get away with slight variations of weight on both sides. The other reason why the painting feels balanced overall is due to the various counterweights that stand to offset what divided the trio into two groups in the first place. 
Earlier, I showed you the twins in isolation. And the reason why this feels balanced, even though the central figure is taller, is because of the fact that the character on the right is occupying more space horizontally. The central figure's superior number of outlines is recompensed by the other through a more pronounced red accent lighting, as well as a better detailed cameo. The trio's differences in head height is compensated on their shoulders that are all found on the same level. The gilded contours found on the coats of the twins but not on Trevor is recuperated through two big golden buttons on his coat. Trevor's farther proximity from the center is made up for it with a more pronounced lean towards that direction, in comparison to the other side where only the head is tilted. The twins' coats that have a warm push makes them partially blend with the background, unlike Trevor's that contradicts the overall theme and makes him stand out in his own right. In the end, everything balances out. To solidify the unity of the three subjects, the characters on both sides are almost a perfect mirror of each other. From the way their heads and chests are turned towards the center character, to the manner of how their arms are bent, supported by their raised shoulders from which it originates, the objective of which is to bring back symmetry into play, all wrapped up by the dark corners of the background that acts as an irregular vignette. These articulations in setting compositional elements as cue, only to rectify it in some other way, is not a foreign concept. Most successful artworks in history follow this fundamental rule, because it's something inherent in all of us. Just like the basic act of walking, a cyclic exercise that's all about throwing ourselves off balance to advance forward, only to catch it into a stable position afterwards. It really is as natural as that. And Custis, Morgan, and the Postulate Child is a perfect example of its execution that's certainly worthy of praise. <laughs>